Chapter 9. The Atomists The founders of atomism were two, Leucippus and Democritus. It is difficult to disentangle them because they are generally mentioned together and apparently some of the works of Leucippus were subsequently attributed to Democritus. Leucippus, who seems to have flourished about 440 BC, footnote, Cyril Bailey, the Greek atomists and Epicurus, estimates that he flourished about 430 BC or a little earlier, end of footnote, came from Miletus and carried on the scientific rationalist philosophy associated with that city. He was much influenced by Parmenides and Zeno. So little is known of him that Epicurus, a later follower of Democritus, was thought to have denied his existence altogether, and some moderns have revived this theory. There are, however, a number of allusions to him in Aristotle, and it seems incredible that these, which include textual quotations, would have occurred if he had been merely a myth. Democritus is a much more definite figure. He was a native of Abdera in Thrace. As for his date, he stated that he was young when Anaxagoras was old, say about 432 BC, and he is taken to have flourished about 420 BC. He travelled widely in southern and eastern lands in search of knowledge. He perhaps spent a considerable time in Egypt, and he certainly visited Persia. He then returned to Abdera, where he remained. Zeller calls him superior to all earlier and contemporary philosophers in wealth of knowledge, and to most in acuteness and logical correctness of thinking. Democritus was a contemporary of Socrates and the Sophists, and should, on purely chronological grounds, be treated somewhat later in our history. The difficulty is that he is so hard to separate from Leucippus. On this ground, I am considering him before Socrates and the Sophists. Although part of his philosophy was intended as an answer to Protagoras, his fellow townsman, and the most eminent of the Sophists. Protagoras, when he visited Athens, was received enthusiastically. Democritus, on the other hand, says, I went to Athens and no one knew me. For a long time his philosophy was ignored in Athens. It is not clear, says Burnett, that Plato knew anything about Democritus. Aristotle, on the other hand, knows Democritus well, for he too was an Ionian from the north. Plato never mentions him in the dialogues, but is said by Diogenes Laertius to have disliked him so much that he wished all his books burnt. Heath esteems him highly as a mathematician. The fundamental ideas of the common philosophy of Leucippus and Democritus were due to the former, but as regards the working out it is hardly possible to disentangle them, nor is it for our purposes important to make the attempt. Leucippus, if not Democritus, was led to atomism in the attempt to mediate between monism and pluralism, as represented by Parmenides and Empedocles, respectively. Their point of view was remarkably like that of modern science, and avoided most of the faults to which Greek speculation was prone. They believed that everything is composed of atoms, which are physically but not geometrically indivisible, that between the atoms there is empty space, that atoms are indestructible, that they always have been and always will be in motion, that there are an infinite number of atoms, and even of kinds of atoms, the differences being as regards shape and size. Aristotle asserts that according to the atomists, atoms also differ as regards heat, the spherical atoms which compose fire being the hottest. And as regards weight, he quotes Democritus as saying, the more any indivisible exceeds, the heavier it is. But the question whether atoms are originally possessed of weight in the theories of the atomists is a controversial one. The atoms were always in motion, but there is disagreement among commentators as to the character of the original motion. Some, especially Zeller, hold that the atoms were thought to be always falling, and that the heavier ones fell faster. They thus caught up the lighter ones, there were impacts, and the atoms were deflected like billiard balls. This was certainly the view of Epicurus, who in most respects based his theories on those of Democritus, while trying, rather unintelligently, to take account of Aristotle's criticisms. But there is considerable reason to think that weight was not an original property of the atoms of Lysippus and Democritus. It seems more probable that on their view, atoms were originally moving at random, as in the modern kinetic theory of gases. Democritus said, there was neither up nor down in the infinite void, and compared the movement of atoms in the soul to that of motes in a sunbeam when there is no wind. 
This is a much more intelligent view than that of Epicurus, and I think we may assume it to have been that of Lysippus and Democritus. Footnote. This interpretation is adopted by Burnett, and also, at least as regards Lysippus, by Bailey. End of footnote. As a result of collisions, collections of atoms came to form vortices. The rest proceeded much as in Anaxagoras, but it was an advance to explain the vortices mechanically rather than as due to the action of mind. It was common in antiquity to reproach the atomists with attributing everything to chance. They were, on the contrary, strict determinists, who believed that everything happens in accordance with natural laws. Democritus explicitly denied that anything can happen by chance. Lucippus, though his existence is questioned, is known to have said one thing. Naught happens for nothing, but everything from a ground and of necessity. It is true that he gave no reason why the world should originally have been as it was. This perhaps might have been attributed to chance. But when once the world existed, its further development was unalterably fixed by mechanical principles. Aristotle and others reproached him and Democritus for not accounting for the original motion of the atoms, but in this the atomists were more scientific than their critics. Causation must start from something, and wherever it starts, no cause can be assigned for the initial datum. The world may be attributed to a creator, but even then the creator himself is unaccounted for. The theory of the atomists, in fact, was more nearly that of modern science than any other theory propounded in antiquity. The atomists, unlike Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, sought to explain the world without introducing the notion of purpose or final cause. The final cause of an occurrence is an event in the future for the sake of which the occurrence takes place. In human affairs, this conception is applicable. Why does the baker make bread? Because people will be hungry. Why are railways built? Because people will wish to travel. In such cases, things are explained by the purpose they serve. When we ask why, concerning an event, we may mean either of two things. We may mean, what purpose did this event serve? Or we may mean, what earlier circumstances caused this event? The answer to the former question is teleological explanation, or an explanation by final causes. The answer to the latter question is a mechanistic explanation. I do not see how it could have been known in advance which of these two questions science ought to ask, or whether it ought to ask both, but experience has shown that the mechanistic question leads to scientific knowledge, while the teleological question does not. The atomists asked the mechanistic question and gave a mechanistic answer. Their successors, until the Renaissance, were more interested in the teleological question and thus led science up a blind alley.